Hi friends, it's Amy and I'm your sewing teacher. I'm here this week to talk to you a little bit about sewing machines. So that's what today is. We're checking out sewing machines with a little bit of a 101 to add. If this is the kind of content that you like, please give this a thumbs up and you can always subscribe and click the bell in order to be notified of upcoming videos on Sundays. Let's get started. Now maybe it's the teacher in me that I feel like I need to give you just a tiny bit of history. So this is what I know. In France in 1830, there was a gentleman inventor named Bartholomew Thimonaire, and he created the, one of the first mechanical sewing machines. That mechanical sewing machine was actually a success for him and he mass produced them until he had a studio of about 80 machines. And he was manufacturing things like uniforms at a mass manufacturing rate. However, after a year or so, he had some issues with the tailors and seamstresses in the area and they lit his shop on fire. He lost all of his machines and that was it. Go across the pond to the United States and we come across a gentleman named Walter Hunt. In the early 1830s, so about the same time, Walter was really working on a design of a mechanical sewing machine that was similar to the one that was created in France, but it looked a little bit more like the sewing machines we have today. Now, he had a little bit of crisis at heart and decided that, you know, after working on this for about six years, in 1838, he decided to give up the quest for the perfect sewing machine because he was afraid that he was going to put tailors and seamstresses out of business. After Hunt had stopped trying to produce his machine in 1838, a poor tailor's apprentice decided that he was going to try to make a mechanical sewing machine. That mechanical sewing machine that he created, he patented in the 1840s. Now, this made Elias Howe a very rich man. The patent issues arise because after the failing of his first design, Howe decided that he was going to do something with a hand crank, but inadvertently ended up creating a machine that was almost exactly the same as Hunt's. Now, Hunt had patented his machine in the 1850s, and Howe tried to patent the new machine also in the 1950s and realizing that they were almost identical. So they were in and out of court over the years and it cost thousands of dollars in court fees. Towards the end of the court cases, how was approached by Isaac Singer. Now Isaac Singer realized that he didn't really need the patent that Howe had created for the machine itself because the mechanical machine that Isaac Singer had created was very different than the machine that Howe had created. But in his patent, Howe had included the needle with the eye. And so that created a problem for Isaac Singer because he needed that needle. So what had happened is Isaac Singer brought together seven manufacturers and they created the very first patent pool for the sewing machine needle. And the royalties that Singer and the manufacturers had decided to pay Howe were $25 per machine sold. Now later that royalty was lowered to $5 per machine because of the mass quantities of machines that were created. And even though they reduced the amount of royalties that Howe was receiving per machine, when Howe died in 1867, he died a very rich man, which was very different from his very beginnings as a tailor's apprentice. Now, as we know, Singer didn't do too badly for himself either. Singer is still one of the most famous names in regards to sewing machines. Now, Singer not only had permanent sewing machines that he had installed in people's homes, the treadle machine was still very popular, but in the, eight, in the 1920s, he popularized the portable sewing machine. So it was no longer attached strictly to a table. It could be carried around in its little case as people decided to take their sewing machines from one locale to another. Now, although technically portable, those machines were still cumbersome and very heavy. And it wasn't until the 1930s that machines start to, started to lighten up a little bit 
and were able to truly become portable. It was in the 1930s that the Path Company decided that they needed to also get into the sewing machine business and they started to create both industrial machines such as my Daisy and home machines that were considered portable. The very first PATH that was manufactured was the PATH 130. It was considered the universal tailor machine. This was the first machine that made it common for use of a lock stitch and a straight stitch and a zigzag stitch. The 130 did not reach the shores of North America but because of the World War. It didn't actually come to the shores of North America until post-World War II. In the 1940s, another company created a zigzag machine that was the Nietzsche Company. And in the 1950s, the Elna Company also began to make sewing machines that were universally used with multiple stitches. Those zigzag stitches were very important historically as that's what was used to reinforce buttonholes and really took away the hand stitching around buttonholes. The Elna machines that were made in the 1950s were very popular because they were the lightest machines made as of yet. We're looking at a 19 pound machine that was able to do multiple types of stitches, including the zigzag. We've talked a little bit about the manual treadle machines versus the electric machines. We've talked about domestic machines coming into the home and the portability of them. It wasn't until the 1970s, the late 1970s, that Singer really introduced computerized machines. So let's get on to what machines I have in my home. 